All right, first people coming in. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Hope you are doing well. I guess we'll wait another minute or two before we get started here as people are coming in. Hey everyone, we will, I guess wait another minute for people to, to join before we get started. So the final chance for everybody that is already here to get a, a coffee, which is highly recommended I guess this time. more people coming in. So I guess it's two minutes past. Can wait another 30 seconds and we get started. All right, it's three minutes past 11, so let's get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christian, and uh, thanks for tuning in to this uh, webinar brought to you by um, Adjust, Empathic, and Custometics. Um, I'm super excited for the talk that we have today. Um, I hope you're excited as well to talk about some uh, data privacy topics. Um, no jokes aside, I think it's a very um, relevant topic. Actually, um, today's webinar is already the, um, the second episode um, I would say um, in a webinar series that we have started around data privacy. Um, the first one was uh, hugely popular, uh, I would say, uh, earlier this year. So um, yeah, um, here's the second episode of it. And today what we really want to focus on is essentially to answer the question of whether um, true data privacy or customer data privacy can really coexist with still proper personalization of that's an either or question. So this is the this is the, the, the headliner question for today. Um, I'm uh, yeah very excited for the talk. I've got some um, awesome guests that I will uh, introduce to you now. Um, before I do that, um, quick disclaimer, there will be time in the end for your questions again. Um, last time I remember uh, we went totally out of, out of time in the end because we had so many questions. Um, we're here to take them again this time. Um, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom um, to submit them because then we will have a nice overview and we can go through them one by one and they can also be votes. Um, so there will be time in the end for questions. Um, we'll try to do like 15 minutes even. Um, and uh, yeah, please submit them in the uh, Zoom Q&A uh, feature, not in the regular chat because that always uh, messes up things. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm happy to uh, welcome our uh, awesome panelists today. Um, so um, I will leave that to you guys. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, maybe Aurelie, if you want to go uh, first as the lady. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Aurelie Pols. Um, I've been acting as Data Protection Officer for MParticle for over three years now. So before the enforcement of the GDPR, I'm also a board member of the European Center for Privacy and Cybersecurity out of Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and also uh, an expert member of the European Commission's Observatory of the Platform Economy. Um, I live in Spain, I'm Dutch and French speaking, so happy to be here. Thanks so much, Aurélie. Um, maybe Vitu, if you wanna go next. 
<laughs> yeah, sure thing. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. I'm Vito. I currently head everything uh, to do with performance marketing at Monzo uh, Bank. Um, we've been live for about six years now in the UK. Um, and I basically take care of everything to do with measurement, uh, tracking, so very relevant to this discussion. And um, I don't speak as many languages as already, um, but I um, do speak Italian, a little bit of French, a little bit of Spanish, and I'm based in London. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. And um, then, Babur, last one up to you. Thanks, Christian. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Babur. Uh, I'm working as the lead product manager at Adjust. Um, I'm heading the Protect Suite products, and it basically has all the data privacy and uh, click spam and click injection solutions that we provide to our clients. Um, I am based in Berlin uh, and um, hope to see you happy soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. Now we'll quickly uh, round it up um, with two words on myself. Um, so I'm Christian. I'm the moderator today. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining here. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Customlytics. Um, we do consulting and agency work for all things we want, mobile marketing. Um, and data privacy, data protection is a big topic for all of our clients. So we are very much looking forward to the, um, the chat today. Um, I prepared a little icebreaker question for you. Um, to kind of get things going and um, yeah, maybe you take a second to feel it and then I'm um, excited to hear uh, what you come up with. So um, here it goes. If you would have to describe the privacy changes in the online world throughout the last years um, in one word, what word would you choose for that? Just one. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> So I'm happy to go first from a maybe a more legal perspective of what is, I think, the word that um, uh, summarizes the GDPR um, and its accountability. Uh, it's within Article 5.2. Uh, it's about the fact that everything we do with data, uh, personal data or not, uh, needs to be documented. And in case of problems, we need to be able to show that we have done the right thing either our own company or together with our partners. Um, so accountability is the word on my side. Thank you. Should I go next? Yeah, if you want. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna approach this from a very different uh, point of view from Aurelie's, which by the way, I 100% agree with. Um, for me, the word uh, from a marketing perspective is gonna be hectic. Um, I think it's really difficult to um, make sure that every co company is compliant uh, in the best way possible. It also means that it's got a lot of ramifications for how you do marketing uh, in this digital era. Um, so I'll choose hectic, uh, no negative connotations, um, but yeah, that's my word. All right, Abu, if you wanna go next. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think the, the, the privacy, um, conditions that we have right now are very fragmented in nature and that is the word that i would use and i'm looking at purely from a technical point of view because when i go ahead and talk with the technical teams and implement it for different regions or different countries it's it's really difficult to have one size fits all solution and and it, it's uh, becomes a big challenge for both sides like for the consumers also and for the implementer mm. for the SaaS providers also so that is the word that I will use. Okay. Um, I was thinking about a word myself. Um, I, so from our side, we work a lot with um, clients who, you know, have to kind of approach this when they integrate um, a tech tool into their apps and, and, or like, um, and they want to design their data privacy um, content management, for example. So the word that I would, I would probably use is, uh, um, complication in the sense that now you you know um it's kind of the a lot of thought is needed these days to kind of do everything that you want to do with any kind of data that's relevant really customer data that's relevant um you really have to invest thoughts about you know how should it be done what's even possible uh what's legal of course is also an interesting question um at times um so i would i would 
use probably I would use the so I would use one word I would say uh, complication. Um, but uh, yeah, happy to discuss. Looking forward to to kind of getting more of your opinions here. Um, so as the kind of um, the the next question resulting from this, um, I think more from a uh, I guess a more general view. Um, I wanted to ask you guys how your companies um, are adapting to the well, pretty dynamic changes in the privacy space. So how how do you even keep up with kind of the recent changes? What's the what's the secret sauce for that? Whoever feels like. <laughs> I can I can kick this yeah. off. Um, Awesome. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question um, because it's very much based on how your company is, was set up before before the changes came into play. Um, as a regulated bank uh, for Monzo, we're actually pretty fortunate that we have obviously a dedicated team um, that takes care of making sure that all of um, all of the things we do um, from a marketing perspective, but also more in general from like a uh, data and product perspective is, is compliant um, with GDPR and all the privacy changes that have happened. Um, so we've got, um, for example, regular sessions with the privacy team to update us on the most uh, recent changes. Um, and we also have pretty strict processes and frameworks in place for us to make sure that we aren't sharing data um, illegally, I guess is the right word, and also that we are storing data in the correct manner. Um, so I'd say in terms of responsibility and ownership, um, it is very centered around the data privacy team specifically, um, but we've structured ourselves in a way that all of the different teams speak to that um, overarching uh, privacy team to make sure that we aren't doing anything illegal. Um, from a marketing perspective, mm -hmm. this is uh, really important. So um, yeah, I think we are just adapting our company structure um, to best address the changes um, as they happen. Which is, which is, by the way, um, and a very interesting observation that that I had. Maybe um, when the other two say about some say something about it, they can agree or disagree with it. Um, one observation that I had because you mentioned um, how you kind of stay up to date by talking to your privacy teams, and that kind of made me think about the clients that we have where my observation is that um, with the data privacy changes and you know more things to be taken into account, um, this is what well, it gets easier as kind of uh, um, proportionally with kind of the size of the company as in bigger companies can afford a privacy team, bigger companies have the resources, money, people, um, to kind of, you know, have something in place like this. Well, I've, I always feel like, you know, smaller companies where it's, you know, maybe prior to this, there are, you know, uh, some technical founder CTO guy could, you know, get away with ju just doing their coding and being f being the data privacy person. It's kind of not sufficient anymore. Um, I don't know what you ever think about it, but that's kind of my observation here. <laughs> I think there's, there's something interesting to note about what you mentioned also the CTO. Um, there are actually uh, rulings in Germany about the fact that the CTO cannot be the privacy person because there's a conflict of interest. Um, and so this is, I think, also important to make sure that these decisions are made by somebody that is independent from the technical evolutions, which is where, as, as I mentioned, I joined in particle in 2018 before the enforcement of the GDPR, and I'm still external and independent DPO. So I report to supervisory authorities. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I basically um, uh, uh, support fundamental rights of individuals. And this is the role of the DPO, which is not the same thing as legal counsel, because mm -hmm. they have to make sure that in terms of risk, the company is as compliant as possible. Um, so who sits where is, I think, still like evolving. And I, I see it also with us at Mparticle. Um, we've been through training. Uh, I do, I have an open door policy. So there are no stupid questions. Please bother me. Uh, this is getting problematic because we're talking <laughs> a lot, but I still can address this. Um, and um, what I basically also did a lot was spy on the product teams. Uh, I got access to everything. And then I just asked questions and knocked on people's doors. And sometimes certain engineers were like, who the hell are you? And what are you doing? I was like, I just have a question. 
Um, I think one of the main challenges we had was to move away from this idea of it's not PIIs, so it's all fine, because PII and personal data is not the same thing. Personal data is way broader. Uh, for e-privacy, it's even broader than personal data in the GDPR, so people tend to forget that, uh, certainly in our industry. Um, and moving forward, more and more discussions about um, products, privacy by design, privacy by default, making sure that we remain a data processor for our customers. We act upon their instructions, uh, the default settings within the tools. Mm -hmm. And then we watch the privacy legislations evolve. Um, I, I started a count up. Um, we're at 148 on a global level. So Rwanda just passed their privacy legislation, nobody cares, I, I understand, but it's linked also partially um, to, to the fact that the GDPR is this kind of blueprint. Um, and so once privacy legislations um, are, are starting to be passed or enforced, we, we look at what it means in terms of functionalities for our platform. It depends also on the markets where we are. So Brazil uh, privacy legislation has consequences and this is what we work on. But generally speaking, we, we keep an eye on evolutions and also depending on the markets where we are to see what it means in terms of functionality. It's a collaborative effort also. I think it's really important, something that was also highlighted before. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Anything you want to add? How does yeah. Edges do it? Sure, yeah, uh, I, I would totally agree with Aurelie that uh, it's not just the PII data and adjust is uh, managing their own servers. So uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And, and that, that is the thing. That's why we um, have a fraud prevention team and information security team who give us all that input, what needs to be done. And we make sure that all the client data stays within that region. And it's not just certain fields that stay in that region is the whole raw data the whole raw data pipeline is within that region and once the data gets aggregated then it's like just numbers so then it can be shared outside the region but we ensure that all the data remains within the same region of privacy mm. very interesting point that that um i i heard in both uh, your um um Oli and both in your um in your answers, which is kind of this notion of understand in the first place, even understanding what is um, what is data that needs to be protected, what is PII, and what's not. So, Hustaya, maybe we can we can talk about this a bit more. What is the well? I'm not even saying rule of thumb because nothing is easy in the in the data privacy land. But um, how can I even as a kind of business uh, even understand which data needs to be kind of protected in a certain way? What's the What's the, uh, the measure? So I'm happy to take that one because uh, I, I focus a lot on it. So what's important to understand is that PII, personally identifiable information, um, is a term that's still used a lot. Um, and it's an old term um, because the way it's defined is that the, these are PII are single variables, so one variable, defined by each US state. So email, typically, uh, things like that. In California, we did, we did an analysis of the different states many years ago. In California, hair color is PII. Don't ask me why. I don't know, but it's like that. So it's one variable. Then this lady came up called Letania Sweeney, who said, you know, that's a problem. Because if I take zip code, gender, and date of birth of the American population, I can re-identify over 95% of individuals. So suddenly it's not just one variable, it's a mix of variables. And this is where the GDPR came along and said, personal data is one or more variables that can, could potentially uniquely identify an individual. Mm -hmm. So this is the big difference. Um, California, the Privacy Protection Act then came up with personal data, personal information, which is kind of similar. And then there's like other categories, um, special categories of data. Mm -hmm. um, we also call them sensitive data, even though it's not the same thing, uh, but that's race, eth ethnicity, things like that, that require consent under the GDPR. Sensitive data in the US is typically financial health and social security numbers. Um, and this is the threshold of our platform. Our platform does not accept, according to our terms and conditions, 
special categories of data or sensitive data, um, which also brings about conversations because sometimes we get, you know, uh, customers like banks. And obviously, we're not going to take in uh, bank account numbers because it's against our terms and conditions. But what about credit scoring? Is that sensitive data? What's our obligations? What are our customers' obligations? So we have conversations with our customers about that to either transport, transform before it's uploaded and make sure the security is, is well rounded around there. And then the last bit is e-privacy. The directive we all love and hate, I know, um, is um, about electronic communications. So it's way broader than personal data. Um, IP addresses cookies are already inside the GDPR. But when we talk about other types of tags or triggers or things like that that are being used, certainly when we talk about um, web-based uh, solutions, then this is also covered by e-privacy. But there's still discussions. E-privacy is, is a strange piece. So this kind of sums it up. I, I hope it makes sense. Thank you. Um, anything, anything you ever want to add to how to kind of uh, understand what data needs to be protected? I, I, yeah, I can go. I can go next. Um, I I basically agree with everything already said. Obviously, um, really difficult for me to identify based on my hair color, uh, which I thought was quite funny. Um, but um, yeah, I think the important thing to to note as well is that there's this misconception that um, people that think people usually think that PII data uh, just refers to non-hashed uh, data points, but the reality is that. A lot of identifiers, um, even whether they're hashed. So, you know, it's not just like email, but even hashed email, for example, is classified as um, as personally identifiable uh, data points, um, and that has really important ramifications on exactly how you can use that from a marketing perspective. Obviously, there's different types of communications, um, but an important one, for example, is when you um, decide. Uh, to share data with a third party, um, let's say publisher. Um, we can take the likes of the biggest like Facebook or Google. Um, you have to be very, um, very careful on exactly uh, understanding how they store that data as well and how you're sharing it with them. Uh, that's something that a lot of marketers kind of sweep under the carpet. Um, but it actually to understand uh, how the storage from their end works, especially if you're a bank, um, is extremely, extremely important. Um, with regards to sensitive data, 100%, um, banks have a lot of data, uh, which is classified as sensitive data. And the interesting thing about, for example, um, Monzo and the way we work is that not everyone obviously has access to uh, every type of data variable. Um, we have several rounds of approvals if an individual within the bank needs access to certain types of data, um, which is just one of the many controls that we have to make sure that not everyone has access to um, sensitive information and it doesn't fall in the wrong hands, uh, essentially. Um, so really important topic, I think. Yeah, um, and in terms of um, specifically PII, it's really hard for um, someone who has apps which spans multiple regions because each region has their own uh, rules and regulations. So it circles back to the fragmentation point that um, they're, they're always juggling with all these different fields, like which field should be available in which region and not to other regions. and for which we need consents and for which we don't need consents. And so um, this is something that really needs to be hammered on the head. Like we, we need to define a unified policy, uh, maybe a basic set of fields, which everyone agrees on. Like these are the ones that in all the regions should be defined as PII, but then each region can define on top of that, that these, these are the ones that could be part of or not part of the PII information which should be part of the privacy regulation in all those regions. Mm. Yeah, very interesting point with the uh, international differences. Um, maybe um, next up, we move on a bit to the more technical side, which I think is maybe also a bit more, um, I guess, um, applicable 
applicable to the kind of the real world experiences that the the audience has, uh, which is they are probably um, in charge of the marketing of a given app, or they uh, one way or the other they are, um, and they are working with different tools. Um, and I think one relevant uh, technical vendors, uh, one relevant question that I would have for you is essentially um, how in this scenario, how do you keep the, the balance or what kind of roles do all the different cloud providers, um, data controllers, tools that you use, how, what, what kind of role do they play in the bigger picture of, uh, of compliance with, with data privacy regulation? Um, and how do you, yeah, I guess, how do you even keep track of all of that? Yeah, I can, I can take that. So, um, Apart from the PII information that we discussed, there is also another aspect of uh, how the regulation handles the storage of the data, the in transit data, either the transmission and processing of the data is also a part of it. So when we look at how the data is being stored and processed, it's really important to see which parties are involved in that uh, transit of the data because the internet works in a very weird way like the, the data can pass through different regions before it, it, it um, aut autonomously works in, in a way to find the uh, least path of resistance so it's really hard to pinpoint where the data will land it, it's the client could be either from germany or they could be traveling in us or italy or any anywhere in the world so how that data you can ensure that data ends up in the region where it's supposed to be so um, with, with the SaaS providers and the cloud providers, I would say they're doing a good job in ensuring this, but they have to optimize their own resources. It's really hard to um, make sure that all the data ends up in that region where it's supposed to be because it, it would become really difficult. And then there is this question of replicating the data because you have to make sure if one data center goes down, then what happens in that case? So uh, it's a, a trade-off between, um, I would say, protection of the data and also the optimization of how you use the resources in all of those things. Uh -huh. I guess uh, already naturally uh, with the, with your background, you probably have a strong opinion <laughs> on this, which I would like to hear. <laughs> um, well, it, it it was clear from the beginning um, that MParticle plays the role of um, data processor or service provider on the CCPA for our customers. So as a platform, mm -hmm. uh, we did work initially the first two years on our obligations as a data controller. Uh, so that is our own data uh, for which we are responsible, which is not the same. Um, we also make sure, so as we connect data with our partners, um, we don't play a role with respect to the data of our partners. It is our customers who decide that the data that is ingested in our platform goes to our partners. Um, so we've had some conversations in the past with partners who said, you are a sub-processor to us. And we were like, no, we're not. Um, so this, this legal strategy of saying, which role do we play inside the entire ecosystem? What are we responsible for? Is I think that the, the pivotal structure of the legal strategy, but also the technical strategy. Um, I always tell the product teams, I'm not against us becoming a data controller or a joint controller uh, in our platform, but you need to tell us because this has consequences in terms of obligations. Yeah. Um, so as I spy on the product teams, holding the data processor line, and making sure that we act upon the written instructions of our customers is our main objective, making sure that basically we serve them the best way possible and support also our partners. And so our partners play their own role, their own choices. They can be controllers or processors for our customers. We're fine with that. And we will align and we work ideally also on interoperability to make sure that these obligations and expectations work together. Um, and this is where I think collaboration is important. I, I do realize as, as we also um, have, as, as Vito mentioned, you know, um, data governance teams and we have data scientists who want access to data 
I do realize that they don't always see these differences. What, what are we, what data can you use? Um, data, for example, on how employees of our customers use our platform is a very specific niche discussion that we have to improve our products, but there are limitations to what's possible. So we've had conversations, but also at, at really high level to say, okay, what would be our philosophy around this? What would legitimate interest of using this data look like? What is acceptable and what is not? And so we have mitigation measures around this. We, we delete data, we aggregate data, a lot of things that, you know, uh, both Peter and Babu also talked about. Uh, but it's always very context related. And this is what we see in this conversation as well. I have one angle, Babur has one, Vito has another. Uh, and this is where we all try to have all these conversations that you're fostering here. Mm. I think um, one um, interesting, maybe um, kind of practical uh, thing that, that I can add to this um, is that whenever I, it sounds kind of basic and like um, maybe like overly obvious but still then when I see how kind of companies behave I feel like it's still worth mentioning it um, so especially like we, when we get into projects very often there is already a landscape of different um, last tool tech providers in place and it's typically a combination of different tools um, you would be surprised and that's always the first thing we do when we talk about you know where's data even flowing to even understand who could be a data processor in this scenario, um, one of the one of the first things we always do is actually look at uh, it's as basic as drawing a map of hey this is the tool set that exists and this is the kind of data that's flowing in the different directions. Um, I, I'm always like surprised that that this basic thing doesn't exist in some uh, in some companies when they kind of start looking into it. I mean it, it's also has improved over time and of course as we work with clients on this this is kind of you know changing. Um, but yeah, maybe a practical tip uh, is really to start with a, a, a flow chart um, where you kind of visualize which kind of tools you have in place, what kind of data is flowing. There will be many, many, many arrows in there, um, but it's just like, you know, how otherwise, how do you even want to kind of understand uh, uh, kind of what's going on um, and kind of be, um, especially if you don't use uh, a CDP like, um, like a particle. How do you even want to kind of understand where data is stored and then let alone if a, a customer is kind of requesting uh, to understand what data they which they legally are kind of uh, obligated which they can do um, to even understand what, what data is stored with you and in all the systems or even to get it deleted that's kind of a complete nightmare um, if you don't kind of have that so maybe basic tip but i see it missing in some companies so um, there you have it um, yeah, Aurelie, you made a nice um, switch already in, in the last um, answer that you gave from, oh, uh, we're talking about partners, but actually, you know, for us, that's customers. Um, I want to stick with the customer um, in the sense of kind of the end consumer um, for, I guess, one of the core questions why people have kind of joined the, the webinar or that was kind of uh, promised for us to answer. Um, and that's kind of the following. Um, how do you educate um, consumers in the sense of end customers um, about the benefits of data collection and you know for everybody kind of following along things in the mobile app world uh, everybody will understand how that kind of also relates to ATT um, but let's you know maybe keep ATT out for now and only talk about how we can educate customers and customers to kind of understand the benefits of data collection to kind of you know the consent let's maybe break it down like this once worst, I guess Babu has uh, a lot of experience from from adjust clients with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, adding to what Aureli said um, and and answering your question also. So there is another layer of like there are two types of companies. One company, one type of companies are who are like the end providers who are like an end of the pipeline. But then there are some companies who are at the middle, like adjust as an attribution provider and we are connected with the advertisers and the publishers and the networks and everyone. So um, one of the funny things that happened to me, we, we are setting up our own uh, data center in Turkey to provide data privacy there. And when clients were um, 
onboarded on those and they, they, they asked us like, can we still use uh, Facebook and Google and all of those attribution providers? So it's, it's really difficult for someone um, um, as a third party to control how that data is being stored on, on these partners. So um, educating the clients about all of those things that uh, there are certain limitations to which each company can have on the data and uh, then uh, once it leaves our premises it's really hard to control how the data is being saved where it is saved um, also we we provide different um, options like you can export the data to different cloud providers so um, we have to inform the clients that they have to ensure that the data that their bi systems are using or they are exporting to different systems should also comply to these uh, regulations and um, it is in the interest or, and responsibility of the clients themselves um, to, to ensure that there is this fine line between this data where, where the client's responsibility mm. ends and the and the provider's responsibility starts so it's it's a two-way thing and and both of these parties should work together to ensure that data privacy is um, there mm. Um, I can I can jump in from like a mm. client side perspective. Um, so, as a bank, obviously we have our customers at heart, and one of the most difficult ways um, to to communicate such difficult concepts is to do so in a very simple manner. Uh, one of the philosophies that we have at um, Monzo is that we want to like talk to people as they would talk to their friends. Um, and for, for concepts, for complicated concepts like uh, data privacy, um, this is increasingly difficult. And we actually have um, dedicated copywriters to, um, to send messaging, uh, whether it's by email, for example, um, trying, to, trying to explain how we, uh, to customers how we're using the data. Um, mm -hmm. And this might be an automated uh, service. So, uh, it's basically would fall under like a transactional type of communication. I think the important thing that mm -hmm. we want to tell customers as well and explain to them is that there's different types of communication and their, their data is essentially, um, is essentially uh, governed by these different types of messaging. So mm -hmm. you'll have, for example, direct marketing, you'll have um, transactional communications and you'll have like service communications and these different types of uh, communications will require different um, consent types from the from the from the customers themselves, um, and this is super important because it gives the ability to the customer to decide exactly on what type of um, messaging they want to receive, and therefore what type of what type of their personal data um, the company uh, can essentially use. Um, so it's it's a really interesting topic. Um, it also requires a lot of testing from from our teams. Um, you said obviously you mentioned ADT. Um, you said keep it out, but I would just briefly touch on it. Um, one of the things one of the things that um, we're currently doing is trying to test at what stage um, in a customer's um, like life cycle within within the Monzo app is the best place to show this communication to make sure it's not so much for an opt-in uh, for an opt-in uh, as the ultimate goal, but it's really to help the customer understand exactly how we're using the data, if they feel comfortable with it. Um, up till now, Monzo only uses, uh, in the past, has only used IDFA or GPS ad ID um, as ad as IDs, hashed IDs that we would ever, for example, share um, with their consent, obviously mm. to third parties, and we'd never share anything else, but making sure that customers understand this is super important. Cause obviously like, especially with the financial world, you'll get so many like data breaches, leaks, um, and it is at the end of the day, sensitive information, which people don't want to necessarily share. And therefore having that governance uh, and that, um, security system in place to make sure that that doesn't happen is, is vital for the for the mm. for the well-being of the company and also for the customers i also think that generally speaking um 
And I think this all makes sense, but also generally speaking, if we think about the customers, the end users, I'm not sure everybody has the same approach to privacy or considers um, what is acceptable in the same way. Um, so, I, you know, in, in marketing, we've talked a lot about personas for the last like 20 years. And I think when it comes to privacy, you also have your personas. Um, and I'm one of these rigid personas where every time I go to my bank, they say, oh, but you can do this in the app. And I'm like, I'm not using your app. I'm not going to use your app. I refuse to use your app. If you push me to use your app, I'm leaving your bank uh, because I'm that kind of persona that for now doesn't trust how mobile phones use my personal data and will always go back to, for, for the moment, desktop, unless you prove me otherwise. So it's, it's really also this relationship of trust, um, depending on how allergic you are to certain uses of data. Um, and so this messaging could also be slightly different depending on who you are. I've seen terrible messages. Yeah. Just, I've seen great stuff. And I would like more personalization because there are certain things I just love and want more of. Um, where at the end of the year, I buy advent calendars. I like to collect them. And I have like certain brands that send me an email every year in October, November to say, we have your advent calendar of chocolate, tea, and, and nice stuff. And so I'm like, yeah, total taker. Do that once a year, hit me up. I will buy. There's no problem. So it really depends on, you know, this relationship, notion of trust. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, no, please go on. No, uh, just to build on that, um, as Early was saying, like with her example, um, you have cases where, you know, you're happy to receive one email uh, a year um, because it's something you love and it's something that's very personable to yourself. Um, and therefore getting that initial messaging uh, right for a company so that a user doesn't opt out everything because ultimately like there'll be things will, that will be less relevant um, mm. especially as uh, different third parties also start limiting the types of data that are shareable uh, across uh, companies and parties. Um, it starts becoming really important to inform and to get it right from the start. Um, otherwise, you will just get customers that um, blanket opt out of any email marketing uh, or any mm. marketing in general, direct marketing, which means that Yes, you'll get um, less emails, less personal notifications, whatever it is. It also means that in, for example, in the case of Aurelie, something that she loves, uh, she wouldn't know about or be reminded about. And therefore for companies getting that right, right from the start is like essential, um, essentially for their business model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really, um kind of uh, would stress the kind of the trust aspect that, that both of you mentioned. I think um, when you when you talk about getting kind of consent from the end consumer for any kind of data collection um, efforts or ATT on that uh, on that matter, um, I think it's very important that you kind of stick to the um, the, the, the truth um, and kind of not really bend it. Um, so I think back in the days, you know, when um, push notifications on iOS were kind of the only thing where, where you had to get consent. Um, you know, that was a thing where you could maybe, it was never a great idea, but you could maybe get away with, you know, uh, bending the truth a bit and talking about how, I don't know, you can give the push consent and then receive updates or whatever. And in the end you sent, I don't know, marketing messages. That was kind of, you know, never a great idea, but you could get away with it. With the data consent, yeah, not so much. Um, you should, you should, I guess, really stick to the uh, the truth and kind of, you know, educate the customer why it's a good idea and avoid any surprises in the future because those surprises will uh, maybe have um, more negative outcomes than people opting out from your push notification. Um, very good. I think we can do one more um, question from my side before we open up for the questions from the um, audience. So a uh, quick reminder for everybody that um, is in the audience if you have more questions, please submit them now into the uh, the Q and A section here in, in Zoom. We have already um, a few submitted. We already have also a few collected from people that actually sent them in via mail. Thanks a lot for that before. Um, so, final question before we move on to the um, 
before we move on to the questions from the audience, from my side would be, um, what are the um, business goals and object? You know, everybody is always talking about the data privacy stuff with a kind of oh, it's something I have to look after in a slightly negative kind of you know connotation. But what are the business goals and objectives that you can kind of relate to data transparency, privacy in your business? Is there anything, you know, what do you look at? to say, oh, you know, we've been successful with our data protection strategy. Yeah, I promised I'd take that one with pleasure. So, <laughs> um, uh, so my main KPI remains training uh, and uh, certainly fulfillment uh, of uh, our general onboarding and, and training with respect to data protection and privacy. Uh, it's separate from security. Um, so let, let me be very clear, security and privacy is not the same training. So that has to be 100%. And so it also means we need to nudge and push certain people to actually take it. But I'm used to that. Um, turning this also into more specific training per departments, certainly as we are growing. And then we started also obviously tracking as a data controller, um, how many uh, of our, um, our own processors have data protection agreements, um, making sure that international data transfers are covered also by standard contractual clauses as we are a US-based company. Um, so these are some of the KPIs we are looking at. We also started measuring how many um, yeah, requests we got, uh, the privacy office. So that's like that went exponential uh, over the last 18 months and it just keeps on going. A uh, number of questions related to privacy, specifically in RFPs uh, as well. Uh, it used to be a lot of security, like 80%, and then we had like two, two questions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of RFPs, but it, because it allows us to see what, who is asking what, what are they thinking about? Um, so this is, you know, our general privacy program dashboard that slowly but surely is being built up. Um, we'll probably add more in terms of features, in terms of product privacy by default and design, but I'm not sure how we're going to measure that yet, but uh, it will be part of it, um, our yearly uh, review. So gives you an idea. A lot of standard contractual clauses. The latest KPI is going to be how to change between the old standard contractual clauses to the new standard contractual clauses, thanks to the European Commission. And then the UK is this strange thing in between with their addendum, and we're not sure. So we'll see. So we can make up KPIs, no problem. <laughs> I can put the other. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, it, it just it, it was really important for us to draw that line between two different things. So one is explicit data residency and then there is implicit data residency. So explicit data residency is that you control the whole pipeline, the, the, the flow of the data, the processing, what's the storage and all of these things. And we went really the extra mile to ensure this. And when the data starts from the SDK, from the app of, of, of our clients, um, we have changed the endpoints there. So it ensures that if there is data supposed to end up in Turkey, so the whole pipeline has been designed in such a way that ensures that the data ends up in Turkey. So there are certain SaaS providers which would just say like, um, yes, our cloud provider is um, data privacy compliant. That's why we are data privacy compliant. But for us, um, that was not enough because as I said, we own our own servers. So um, the whole uh, life cycle of the data is really important for us. And that was the one thing that uh, we had in mind when uh, we went ahead designing data privacy and data localization and um, all of the products that we uh, provide to our customers. So um, I would say that is the one thing that will remain our focus in the future also as a company to ensure that all of the data remains within that uh, boundary of uh, defined boundary by our clients so that there are no penalties or any type of regulations that that could be affecting them. Okay. Um, very good. Then uh, I think we're pretty good on time. We have uh, another 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, let me quickly take a look. By the way, you can still um, submit questions and we will then go 
through them. We'll go for the ones that are submitted here in Zoom first, I guess, and then switch to the pre-submitted ones. Um, <laughs> that's nice. I will take it just because it's an anonymous uh, part participant, which is a great fit for the <laughs> topic of today. Um, so anonymous uh, participant asks, uh, at Vito, um, and I will quickly uh, mark this, what does the privacy team at Monzo look like? Which different functions are in there and who for marketing, except from you, is part of it? I think you're mute. Sorry. So the uh, privacy team uh, at Monzo is pretty extensive. Um, we've got, I believe we've got a team of about seven or eight people of which four are basically always on hand to answer any like marketing queries. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, who from marketing apart from myself is part of it. So technically speaking, I'm not actually part of the privacy team, um, but the privacy team is a centralized function or a centralized team rather. Um, and we will have kind of representatives that uh, for their specific function uh, need to be in close communication with the privacy team. So myself specifically, because um, I'm responsible for everything digital uh, marketing um, from like a direct I'd say like an acquisition performance marketing perspective um, and remarketing perspective as well. Um, I'll always be in close contact with everyone from that team. Um, but we also have someone that, for example, takes care of uh, CRM. And now currently we are uh, kind of integrating um, a CRM tool with, with um, all of our data. Um, and getting an understanding, uh, also touching on what I already said before, getting an, an understanding of what data we can share and what we can't and what we're comfortable doing is extremely important. Something you, Christian, had also mentioned before was having this understanding of like how data flows um, and having a flow chart is exactly the kind of approach that we've used to understand, okay, um, if, so, if a user like shares their email with us and are we allowed then to share it to a third party, uh, how long will they store it for? Um, what if the user in it is inactive? How long will they store um, the, that information for? And what about ourselves? Um, so the fact that we have a centralized team means that they have visibility pretty much on everything that's going on um, from a data perspective and a privacy perspective um, in the bank across all different functions, whether it's product marketing, um, any function really. Um, so I hope that kind of answers the question. I know it was kind of vague. Um, the fact that I'm not actually technically part of the privacy team um, means that I just have a like working relationship with them, but that does involve like being in very close communication with them so that um, we are always compliant from that perspective. All right, thank you so much. Then let's hop on to maybe the other uh, anonymous um, participant has put a question here. Um, so question goes, what would be the best way to get the consent of the customers to use the PII personal data for the person as advertising? According to GDPR, we have to include the separate checkbox where we are explicitly asking for the consent. Is there any other way? Who wants to take it? Maybe or Aurélie? Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to take that. No, no. No, because um, there is this very specific article inside the GDPR that talks about consent and purpose. And personalized advertising is a very specific purpose. Um, whether these purposes have been clearly defined, uh, when you look, for example, at consent management tools and you know those categories, um, and you kind of dig deeper, um, I know that there's a there's an interesting publisher that considers Google to be a category, which is interesting. Uh, but the answer is no, because for each purpose, you need to have a specific consent under the GDPR, and then you need consent because it's e-privacy. Um, so that's my legal uh, perspective as a DPO. And then typically I start negotiating with marketing. Um, and uh, when I talk to marketing, my initial stance is always, 
you don't want risk, you don't collect anything. Now you do want to collect anything, so let's have a conversation about what is acceptable or what. Um, but as GDPR and, and e-privacy is really a risk-based um, uh, legislation, and this is what it's about, it's about you know defining whether you are willing to take the risk not to ask for consent or not, but that's your choice. Mm. I can I can add to what already said. Mm. Um, it, it's mm. extremely it, it's it's true. Like one of the things that we do is uh, at Monzo is if we don't ask for consent, then we automatically opt customers out from any type of marketing. I think that's the lowest path to risk um, that we can take. Um, as a marketing function, we're also very aware of the difference between, for example, well, we need to comply with PECR, um, and as already was saying, like. There has to be specific consent for different purposes. So, you know, a customer needs to be able to give consent freely. Um, it needs to be specific and informed um, in relation to the actual purpose of what you're giving consent for. Um, and then it has to be un unambiguous. Um, that means that, you know, there has to be specific and deliberate action to agree to the kind of direct marketing that the company is uh, trying to do for the customer. So. Those three elements um, are like very important for a marketing team and a company in general to adhere to and make sure that when they do receive consent, that it is for a specific purpose. Um, otherwise, I'd say to avoid any risk, stay out, um, like opt, opt customers out um, by default so that you are running the lowest path to risk. Hmm. Um, maybe because it's kind of um, it kind of two questions in one here. Um, I guess the first part of the question is one that also came up in the pre-submitted questions, um, which I guess in easy words comes down to, oh, you know, if there's no other way um, to do it, then, you know, what can you do to encourage people to give, the, you know, the ATT opt-in, the uh, opt-in to use personal data. Um, so maybe we can, uh, we can quickly uh, talk about this. So what are the, you know, what can you do to, to encourage people to actually leave their consent for the ATT prompt? Uh, I, Maybe Babu, you want probably have seen a couple yeah. of good examples. Yeah, just yeah, say. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, what we saw is um, the content of the message is really important. So you have to play around with what, what you are showing to the, to the clients. And um, then uh, if they are providing the consent or not depends, uh, you do the analytics on your own. So it's some type of A-B testing you can do there. Um, also, it's really important to see like data privacy is always um, looked at with this negative connotation. So it's not always for the purpose of monetizing on your data. It's or sometimes to design better products that will help the end users in, in, in the end. So, um, but it's really important to let the user know how that data would be used. So if you are taking consent from the ATT or Google is also bringing up their own um, ways of um, ensuring data privacy, uh, which will be coming soon. So um, in both of these cases, um, it's really important to ensure that the client in the end knows how their data will be used, how it will be stored, and um, what uh, processing would be done on top of the data that you are saving. Mm. Yeah, um, maybe one one practical tip that I would have is, and it's kind of also easy to do, um, you know, just browse the app store for the biggest shopping, e-commerce, and retail apps, uh, like, Salando and and the likes of it. Um, check out the ATT flows that they have, because spoiler alert: all those companies rely heavily on paid marketing, so they have invested a lot of thoughts into getting the ATT content flow right. I guess that's a nice little homework that everybody can do. And, and uh, I've seen I've seen good examples of you know that also strike the balance of what we discussed before, you know, between still telling the truth and still, you know, making it appealing um, to customers to kind of leave the content. So yeah, that's, that would be my, um, my nice little uh, tip. Um, one more minute to go. Um, maybe the last question then that we can take um, from Inga and it goes, 
What about the internal product analytics powered by the third parties? Do you think that customers in the EU or in other countries will be able to opt out from any kind of tracking, even if it's for the internal purposes? Um, who wants to go first here? Babu again? I'm happy. I'm happy to take that one. If I understand it correctly, yeah. um, I interpret this <clears throat> as um, you are a platform like Embarticle and um, there are users on this platform which are employees of customers and the the usage of the platform is being tracked uh, to optimize the use of our platform and the features and the functionalities um what this is what i think it this the, this question is about i might be wrong so i'm happy to be somebody reaches out to me to have a conversation about this um, when we talk about opting out of this, the thing is, this is not consent based. Um, this is part of the terms and conditions of the platform. You are using our service, hence we are going to optimize this. Um, and it's a tricky one uh, because we did talk about, should we ask consent from um, the users of our platform to do this? Does this make sense? And if we don't, what are we going to do? So for the moment, we are at legitimate interest. We are collecting this information for legitimate interest. This is surrounded by mitigating measures. So we make sure that we don't shake the hell out of this and uh, we don't uh, keep this for all eternity and we cannot identify individuals and things like that. So there's a lot of um, uh, grouping going on with respect to this. We are also looking very closely at, for example, decisions by um, the Irish data protection authority around transparency for WhatsApp, uh, because they are also talking about legitimate interest to improve the products and apparently it's not good enough. Um, so this is continuous work in progress because on the one hand side, um, we have a desire by certainly our product teams to better understand how we're doing to support our customers. But on the other hand, there's this balance with privacy. So making sure we find the right balance is something I think we will review every three months at least uh, because this changes and this evolves um, depending on what happens. And then there's you know tricky questions like somebody left a company and they're not an employee anymore and they send a DSR to that company. What do we do? Uh, this it's a Pandora's box. Um, so we're we're li limiting this as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Balance that, but we're also talked about, you know, finding this right right equilibrium um, with respect to how we serve our business, but how we protect the privacy of the users of our platform under contract by our customers as well. So it's it's not an easy one. If I got this wrong, please, you know, hit me up. I'm happy to answer it. I understood it in the same way, and I think, uh, Babu, maybe some fine words because I saw you unmuted yourself, but then Oli was quicker. Uh, something you wanted to... <laughs> yeah, just just quick point that uh, when we were implementing data residency in, at our company, so we have offices in San Francisco, and this question came up, like, if someone wants data residency in EU, would our employees be able to see that data, our dashboards and different um, network teams mm -hmm. and all of those things. And it was really hard to manage this thing in such a way that internally we could have a setup where we could differentiate these things. So uh, I would agree with Aureli that uh, it really is challenging to do it internally in such a way that, um, and, and I think the regulations also uh, are a little bit not very strict on, on this part uh, when it comes to the internal employees. And um, this is a limitation that we have to live with. And, and I don't see any way of opting out of this internal analytics. For third parties, it's a totally different story. So it's really important for the company to see where my data, where my uh, end user's data is stored and mm. that they have to ensure that it's um, according to the contractual agreement that they have uh, with, with their clients. Awesome. Great. Thanks a lot for the additional uh, context there, Babu. Um, we're already four minutes over time. Same scenario as last time. More questions that we can that we can answer. Um, but I guess it's safe to say that everybody that was on the panel today, uh, including myself, we're happy to uh, connect with you afterwards. Feel free to ping us if there's anything you want to discuss um, about this um, exciting and at times frightening topic of data privacy. Then please do reach out. Um, 
thanks a lot for um, for the three panelists that joined me here. Very nice talk, uh, same as last time. I'm looking forward to the third uh, episode of the uh, data privacy um, webinar. Um, thanks for taking the time for everybody that joined today. Um, have a nice rest of the day. Stay safe, stay calm, and carry on. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.